Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Amargan. I appreciate your uh, introduction. And I'm going to put my timer on because I promise I will not go over 30 minutes. That's plenty to hear from me, I'm sure. So my timer's on. So dear uh, Fulbright uh, Commission in Turkey, uh, let me just say what an honor it is to be part of this panel today and how grateful I am for the invitation from professors Armagan, uh, I'm pronouncing that probably all wrong, uh, of Beykoç University, and also from Dr. Betty Delevi from the Turkish Fulbright Commission. Uh, my remarks today, as was mentioned, will address the theme of mobility, internationalization, new trends, and the US perspective. However, while, we're, while my remarks will touch on general themes that I believe all of us who work in international education need to be thinking about, and certainly they relate to Turkish and US relations, they won't be exclusively on either country, but more macro. Um, I can also quickly say that my remarks have been uh, enriched to some degree by work I've been doing over the last three years with uh, two Turkish scholars. One is Gülsa Tashi, and the other is Seyfi Kenan, both of Marmara University where we've been looking at an intercultural analysis of faculty internationalization experiences in some North American and Turkish universities comparatively. And then finally, before I get into my remarks, I just want to thank one of the students in my international higher education course, uh, Ms. Ji Yi Choi, for her research assistance. That's been very helpful. So thank you, Ji Yi. Um, as was mentioned, um, I'm at GW University and I've been working for a number of years on these themes. If you want to know more, please look at my website. I would be delighted to have you take a closer look. Um, so to speak to today's audience, which in my invitation was characterized as being, quote, international office representatives of Turkish universities, unquote, I've tried to think carefully about how my remarks today can provide you with relevant information to inform and perhaps influence strengthening um, Turkish-US relations in the future with an eye toward impacting uh, our shared work on international education and internationalization and mobility. So my, my understanding is that you're interested in what I might regard as being sort of some of the main themes and topics, some of the issues and problems, and some of the challenges and opportunities that await us in the future, and how we as Americans can work with our valued Turkish counterparts to sustain mobility. Um, so at this time when we're seeing more repressive governments in your part of the world and also in our part of the world coming off of a, a dangerous administration that I hope will not be back, but I don't know, uh, and now starting fresh with the Biden presidency, I will offer, offer some remarks on current themes that I think are important for global higher education broadly and what I think we need to be thinking about. So if you could put up that next slide, please. Um, so my remarks will be supported by three sources. The first is the teaching I do on international higher education in my fall course. The second is uh, my 2016 edited book with Anthony Ogden, and then my 2020 book with Anthony Ogden and Christoph Van Mull, both looking at higher education uh, scholar practitioners. Um, and then the third will be quickly some remarks on a series of seminars I held at GW this year and last year called Reimagining Higher Education Worldwide After COVID-19. And I did that with my faculty colleague, Kyle Long. So next, next slide, please. Uh, so the themes that I generally cover and which are of interest to my students moving forward are the following. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is probably the main theme that students want to hear more about. They really want us to address, in particular, the experience of minority students at home and abroad. In the US context, for example, this means the intersectionality of black students with study abroad as one example, but really looking more at students of color with a, with a sharper focus. Um, they're interested in rankings and are there alternatives to rankings that might change the sort of um, tyranny, if you will, of league tables, um, how we're all sort of conforming to this ranking pressure. Uh, they're interested in virtual exchange, especially after COVID where most of the world went uh, virtual very quickly and we had to adjust and what will be the long-term implications of that. There's a special issue, by the way, on this coming up soon in the Journal of International Students. They're interested, of course, in mobility, as we all are today, um, and mobility in what I think can be characterized fairly as, a, as an inward, more nationalistic, possibly more xenophobic world in many parts of the world. So that's an issue that really is important. They're interested in corruption in the form of shadow education, which we know to be private tutoring for for fees, high fees. And so that is a, a really a way to, to differentiate people of means from those who don't have means and what opportunities that might imply. 
Um, they're interested in the campus climate for international students, both here and abroad. They're interested in global globalization's impact on the global south. Uh, so more focus on underrepresented parts of the world or less represented parts of the world in the research. And they're interested in the environmental and ecological footprint that elite study abroad students or students who get to engage in study abroad, which is a small population often, what kind of footprint they leave on the rest of the world that may not be so fortunate to be able to have these experiences. Um, so they wanna have a more non-Western view on higher education and development. Another area that people are very interested in is the experience of LGBTQ students um, as again, a, a segment that hasn't been looked at with as much detail as, as is necessary. Um, and then finally, they're, they're interested in uh, focusing more on a non-US perspective in, in, the, in the case of my course. So looking more at colonialism uh, and its legacy, post-colonial systems, decolonization, from the US perspective, that might be, for example, Haiti and students from the global south. And then finally, they're interested in the implications of the fourth industrial revolution. And I won't get into that, but you probably know what that's about. So next slide, please. So in my um, co-edited book with Tony Ogden and Christoph Van Moll in 2020 called Education Abroad, Bridging Scholarship and Practice, we reflected on the fact that recent decades have seen unprecedented growth in the number of students who are traveling abroad for the purposes of short-term academic study. So before COVID in the US, for example, there were 333,000 students participating in study abroad across the Atlantic on your side of the, the, the globe, on the European side, um, since the establishment of the Erasmus program 30 years ago, more than 4 million young people have now had the opportunity to study abroad within the framework of that exchange program. So according to UNESCO, by 2025, about 8 million students will be studying abroad, which shows the immense and steady growth of this phenomenon. COVID has put a dent into this, but not stopped it by any means. And trends are going up again, despite new COVID strains and lagging vaccination rates in some countries and regions. So as more uh, tertiary institutions around the world try to include education abroad among their internationalization strategy, there's naturally been an increase in scholarly interest in all aspects of international education. And that's where I come in. I no longer work as a practitioner. I was once the associate director of Northwestern University's study abroad office in Chicago, but I'm now an analyst who studies the bigger picture of international education, but hopefully through that work can also help influence policy and practice. Furthermore, among practitioners, it's become increasingly accepted that it's not enough to just claim that participation in education abroad benefits students and their institutions. We also need specific scientific evidence to support these assertions. So in short, we academics encourage you practitioners to join us in data collection and deeper reflection on the implications and outcomes of, our, of your practice and its implications on your students. So in the 2016 book with Anthony Ogden, International Higher Education Scholar Practitioners Bridging Research and Practice, we argued how critically important it is for scholars and practitioners to work together to produce empirical evidence that challenges and scrutinizes some of the long-held claims and assumptions about the value and benefit of education abroad programming. In our book, we organized our themes around five central questions, participation, programming, student outcomes, institutional outcomes, and societal outcomes. And within those, we address topics like curriculum integration, intercultural competency development, advancing faculty engagement, access and opportunity for underrepresented populations, and what impact the host community feels from exchange. We argued that while research on education abroad is developing quickly, as I mentioned, the field is still undermined by common and often serious methodological and conceptual shortcomings. Much of the research that you may be relying on is often still predominantly institution specific and small scale samples, meaning that much of the research is based on small limited sample sizes is often highly qualitative, which isn't bad, but it could could need a little bit more a broader scope and thus maybe has limited generalizability. So to address these shortcomings, we noted eight major areas of need around student learning, around program outcomes, and the role of higher education institutions. And I'm gonna now briefly go into some of these that you see on your slide. Um, so for example, in terms of academic and professional outcomes, um, a, su a substantial theme in education abroad research is concerned with what students learn through education abroad and what happens after they graduate in terms of career and life trajectories. We need more research on academic development and their labor market outcomes. On the second point, student development, 
Student development has long been a focus of higher education research. In terms of education abroad work, major themes focus on student personal growth and identity development, global citizenship development, intercultural learning, and how students make meaning from their experiences abroad. We, we have been working on understanding those, but we need to understand all of these assumed transformative developments much better. The third point, programming and development. A program area of education abroad research focuses on how design components, for example, student accommodation, academic programming, co-curricular learning, student services, how all of these things impact program outcomes. Much of the existing research has focused primarily on study abroad, and there has been relatively little research on other experience types, such as undergraduate research abroad, international internships, and global service learning abroad. So our focus has been too limited, and I think we can do better in those regards. On the fourth point, student characteristics and demographics, there's considerable research that investigates student characteristics, for example, language proficiency and previous international experience and demographic differences and their relationship to issues such as program choice, student learning and institutional impact. But it's important that education abroad professionals not only understand national enrollment trends, but also understand the enrollment trends within their own education abroad populations. Most commonly, research topics focused on gender, race and ethnicity and financial background is so far still insufficient. We've made strides in the right direction, but more work is needed, particularly as countries become more inward looking um, and um, more nationalistic, more antagonistic to welcoming outsiders, as I mentioned, and sadly, more dangerous. And I'm, we're seeing this in my country, unfortunately, right now, and it's, it's really problematic. So some of the key questions we need to ask ourselves are what is the current profile of, of participants and how does that profile compare across national systems? How does the student profile, for example, their gender, their socioeconomic background, vary by program model or program experience type? And to what extent have efforts to diversify participation been effective or not effective? Five, uh, point five, student choice and decision making. There's a growing body of research that focuses on understanding the factors that influence a student's intention to study abroad and the decisions they make while they are abroad, particularly in terms of their behavior, their adjustment to the setting and their conduct abroad. Along these same lines, intercultural competency, identity development and global citizenship have emerged as key reasons for developing and promoting education abroad. Here, some of the questions we need to ask are, to what extent does education abroad participation enhance student development? For example, psychosocial and cognitive and identity development. To what extent can education abroad program being, programming be leveraged to propel student development, to advance student development? And how does education abroad participation impact their own sense of social responsibility? To what extent, does education abroad participation impact their intercultural competency development? These are all critical questions. They're questions we've all been concerned with for years, I realize that, but I think we can do even deeper and more um, su subtle sort of analyses of these questions. Point six, discipline specific programming. A theme of research examines education abroad programming within specific disciplines, such as agriculture, nursing, social work, and teacher education, but are these are the practitioners we know of who work in our line of work exposed to this scholarship and are they reading it or are they only getting things that are published in our main journals? Think about, for example, the Journal of International Students or Frontiers Journal. There are other disciplines working on this, but are people being exposed to it? Seventh point, discipline specific programming. A growing and increasingly influential research theme focuses on demonstrating how education abroad supports institutional goals, such as increasing student retention and persistence, advancing curriculum internationalization and faculty engagement, fostering alumni loyalty, and enhancing graduate employability. This may sound particularly American, with our high tuition system and alumni loyalty that's tied into sports teams, mascots, and a relentless big money marketing machinery. But in fact, these issues transcend and also concern other countries that hope to slow down or even stop brain drain and to keep their best and brightest talent and scholars at home. On the issue of leveraging education abroad for employability, of importance are key questions like how does education abroad participation increase employability and shape career development? Or how does education abroad participation prepare students for graduate or professional school? And how do prospective employers view the impact and the value of education abroad. 
And then to the last point, national policies on education abroad outcomes. I can say that national policies on education abroad are widely presented, present throughout the world, although most are oriented around quantitative goals and metrics. Very little scholarly attention has been given to documenting and analyzing the efficacy of such policies and related national initiatives. Of importance to this topic are key questions, again, questions, 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 like what are the societal implications of national policy initiatives to advance international education programming? What student level barriers explain cross-country variation in participation rates? And what components of national policy initiatives are most effective for generating mobility? So as we concluded our book, um, we noted four main directives that we felt were imperative for the future of our field and more research we needed to do. We needed to get a better insight into who profits from education abroad. This is the next slide, by the way. Um, so the question of who profits. Another question was, um, while there's a globally overly positive rhetoric about education abroad, it's often too uncritical. Um, so instead of focusing on quantity, there is a greater need to pay more attention to quality. We also need to be thinking about what, what does it mean to have negative experiences and what are the unintended con consequences of study abroad? So not only the good things, but also the things we maybe need to work on and improve. Uh, the third point, we need to go beyond generally asking ourselves whether students want to participate, but rather conduct in-depth analyses of why certain patterns, experiences, or outcomes even exist. So for example, Instead of focusing on whether disadvantaged students are less likely to participate in mobility, the focus should be shifted toward why that is the case. In this regard, we need more cross-sectional research. And that means not just interviewing or surveying students at one particular point in time, but developing and relying on more longitudinal analyses where we can over time study a population and the impact of an experience. On the fourth point, um, education abroad and scholarship often relies on subjective measures where students are asked to indicate what they believe the impact of an education abroad experience was on particular outcomes. But we know that subjective experiences can be quite different from objective measures. So besides relying on self-reports, many of which are um, quantitative or qualitative, studies don't really include control groups in their research designs and with control groups, you really get a different picture of the impact of something. So we need more control groups. And uh, finally, on the fifth point, um, scholars working in the field of education are still, education abroad, are still mainly focused on Asian, Australian, European, and North African, North American contexts, and often single case studies. But we really need to look more at under or less represented regions of the world. For example, the entire continent of Africa has very little research in relation to Europe, for example, on international education, or South America, closer to my part of the world, where again, we really don't know nearly as much as we need to, and we need to focus on that a bit more. So there needs to be research in trying to reach geographically diverse regions of the world and giving us a more balanced focus uh, on the overall picture of internationalization. So the next slide, please. Turning to the last part of my lecture, and I've got 11 minutes left, I'll make it short. Um, I ran a series of seminars last year with a colleague, Kyle Long, on uh, reimagining higher education worldwide after COVID-19. And the main objectives of the three-part seminar series were to develop an interdisciplinary research agenda to encourage high-level thinking about the future of higher education worldwide and comparatively studying innovations in different regions of the world. We addressed these themes at different levels. We looked at a global case, a regional case, and a local case. And each meeting included uh, experts we invited to meet with us virtually, everything was virtual. So in the first seminar um, on November 16th, we called it Rethinking Higher Education for a Post-Pandemic World. And some of the participants included Philip Altbach from Boston College, Noah Sobe of UNESCO, uh, David Paris, the editor of Change Magazine, Robin Helms of the American Council on Education, and Don Whitehead of the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And I'll just go through some of the quick key findings. They, as a group, agreed that the COVID pandemic had affected the quality of higher education substantially uh, because budget constraints had really led to cutting back certain things that were badly needed. Um, they also said that despite years of forecasting, and exercises about what might happen in the future, higher education institutions
institutions were largely unprepared or underprepared for the crisis, and they really should have anticipated what came more effectively. Some of the recommendations they made were that we need to take a less reactive stance and really be more proactive in uh, trying to shape our future. So really think about what can happen in the future and how can we be prepared. Um, so multiple futures need to be envisioned and collectively chosen in order to avoid accepting single future visions created by one part of the world, i.e. The, the center more well-resourced institutions and, and countries, uh, and this should not be imposed on others. So, so there are many different ways to respond to a crisis, and other countries, particularly those in the global south, should not necessarily try to reproduce or mimic what the global north might be doing because it might not be a very good way to, to function. Um, so there's a need to approach the post-pandemic world with the mindset that future disruptions can create avenues and opportunities for innovation and not just be something we have to respond to in a panicky kind of way. That was from those experts in the first seminar. In the second seminar on February 17th, we took a regional spotlight on innovative higher education institutions in the Middle East and South Asia, and we spoke with uh, Bruce Ferguson, the president of the American University of Iraq in Soleimani, and we spoke with Dr. Nirmala Rao, the vice, Pre vice chancellor of the Asian University for Women. Um, both of those speakers expressed plans to include online learning in the future in order to continue to reach students they would not have been able to reach otherwise. So they spoke a lot about inconsistent uh, internet access and faulty power grids and remote locations where we need to do a better job of reaching students who are not necessarily in the metropolitan capitals and don't necessarily have the best resources. But if we improve our technology, we can continue to reach those populations as well. Um, so they spoke a lot about underserved populations and what can be done and really recommended. Um, also, they recommended establishing autonomy for their institutions from the country's government. So trying to not be controlled or, or overly manipulated or influenced by their government, but really trying to work independently so they could pinpoint the problems that need to be addressed. Um, so they said the ad adaptations and changes made by higher education institutions in response to the, to, the, to the pandemic should not be seen as temporary, but instead should be continued to be built on and improved in the future. Again, they talked about the opportunity that COVID had given us to innovate and then to take those innovations and continue to develop them further. And then in the last seminar on April 13th, we looked at one particular institution, the American University of Sicily, as a laboratory for innovation. And I won't say too much on that because it was so specific. Um, I don't think it would be relevant for this broader look at internationalization. But basically, that also found that um, the impact of COVID had been far greater on the most vulnerable and marginalized populations and what could be done about that. Um, so the COVID-19 crisis had forced global learning to happen locally, and this is a practice that institutions should continue to implement post-pandemic. This should be the moment where we finally develop inclusive global learning for students now that we have recognized this type of learning is not limited only to those with global mobility. Many structural issues have been revealed by the pandemic, so higher education needs to be, begin thinking about how solutions for the future can be made and how it can become part of realizing those long term. So higher education cannot be in a reactive position. Rather, educational leaders need to think about and decide how higher, how higher education can shape the future rather than be shaped by it. The pandemic has inspired many leaders to engage in conversations on how, how higher education can play a more active role in shaping the future that is locally envisioned and democratically chosen. So finally, to, uh, to wrap up, I've got six minutes left. Um, my, my colleague or my, my student assistant, G.E. Choi, helped me to construct some basic themes that are come from the American Council on Education and the British, Count, and the British Council, among others. Uh, there have been policy changes with regard to international students and also migration during the Trump administration, where there were heavy visa restrictions and an unmistakably unfriendly attitude toward outsiders, whether they were students, scholars, or migrants, and therefore also increased restrictions on entering our country during the worst days of the COVID crisis. However, with the change in the U.S. administration, the current Biden administration appears to be more willing to work with international students again and has also reopened the doors to migration and taking in refugees. The caps on refugees have massively expanded from something like 18,000 
um, under Trump to 125,000 under Biden. We're working our way up to that. I think right now it's 68,000. Um, so we hope that the, this administration signals a positive restart toward all types of mobility. And I include migration in mobility because those are students experiencing a different system, even if they're not traditionally study abroad type students. So we do hope that this also has this friendlier attitude of our government will also influence Turkish students and scholars to spend time in our country and learning together with us where we can learn from one another. Um, the British Council report in 2021 also talked about ways that, that mobility is opening up again. Um, providing easy, we need to provide easily accessible information. We can run matchmaking activities for groups and institutions which bring together staff working at similar levels within higher education. Today's event, I think, for example, uh, is a good illustration of that. We're learning from each other and communicating with each other on good ideas. Um, we might consider developing new forms of collaboration, such as lifelong learning partnerships, open university collaborations, more diverse forms of short-term student and staff mobility, and joint postgraduate programs. We need to be adaptable and innovative in the use of technology. Um, and uh, Dr. Robin Matros Helms of the American Council on Education, who's a friend and a frequent speaker in my classes, recently talked to my students, and she put it very simply. She said, quote, the field of higher education is characterized by a scrappy creativity. So let's assess it, let's figure it out, and let's move forward, was her quote. Another person I wanna cite is my colleague, uh, Professor Lara Engel, who I work with uh, on a daily basis. And she has, we've been exchanging emails about the future of our field and the future of our program. And she said that, quote, many areas of international education have grown in relevance in this pandemic, given all of the uncertainties that are facing education in a post-pandemic world. The continued and pressing need to address and adapt to climate change and to advance climate justice the need to cultivate more just and inclusive and diverse perspectives in education spaces, both domestic and abroad, the development of all kinds of global competencies mandated by labor markets and societal shifts, and how to cultivate these competencies when physical mobility is limited. So she sees the field as more relevant now than it ever has been before. And finally, to my last slide, um, I like to quote my dear friend, Christopher Glass, He's at Boston College, um, and he recently characterized the future of international education this way, as this quote, in his uh, Compact on International Education, which he wrote together with Kara Godwin and, again, Dr. Robin Mattress Helms for the American Council on Ed Education. And he says, the future requires a different kind of conversation about international student inclusion and success, a new compact that recognizes that the same trends heightening risks in the near term also generate opportunities to produce better outcomes for international students in the long term. We believe colleges and universities can meet this moment with a more expansive vision for why they want to invest in international student inclusion and success with outcomes that benefit students, institutions, and society. So with that and one, uh, one minute left, I will just thank you for listening. Um, I really appreciate your attention. I hope I didn't speak too long and I'm very interested in your questions and any discussion we can have. So thank you.